So I will ask Maria uh, to present you, and then we can start. And thank you once again very much to, for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Leticia, um, uh, and, and Juliana, and all of you present today. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bagus Mujadi, uh, Director of the Indonesia Doctoral Training Partnership, Coordinator of the UK Indonesia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Sciences, uh, Assistant Professor here at the University of Nottingham of Chemical Engineering, and a very, very good friend and someone that is the, one of the, after so many years talking about science diplomacy and trying to, to get it into the leadership of the university, uh, we had our first conversation about it and it immediately clicked and it was amazing what Bagus could uh, do under this framework uh, single-handedly. I don't know if you've listened, there is, you know, the, the, some of the countries that people have been talking more about during the, in the context of COP26 is Indonesia. Um, and I, I would say that Bagus single-handedly made, made this approximation between the Indonesian government and the UK government. He's very well regarded in UK, but he's a proper celebrity in Indonesia. He goes to TV and all that. And I'm going to describe here the scientific side of things, but I, I just want to make sure that people know that Bagus is celebrity. I'm looking forward that he takes me to to Indonesia so I can get a bit of his of, of his star lifestyle. So uh, since 2017, Bagus has been an assistant professor of chemical and environmental engineering at the University of Nottingham and an adjunct assistant professor at Virginia Tech in the United States, as uh, he told us just now. He's the director of Indonesia Doctor Training Partnership and the coordinator of the UK Indonesia Consortium for Inter Interdisciplinary Sciences. Prior to joining the University of Nottingham, he was a research associate at Earth Science and Engineering, Imperial College London, and at the Institute of Mathematique de Toulouse, France. He received a master's degree and a PhD in Applied Mechanics from the National Taiwan University in 2008 and 12, respectively. And uh, he started his academic life in 2006, uh, 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 the beginning of his academic life uh, uh, concluded uh, with his first degree in mechanical engineering from the Institute of Technology, Bandung, Indonesia, uh, with an uh, institution with which he's got very strong links up to this day. Bagus's highly multidisciplinary expertise resulted in high impact publications and grants in the fields of earth sciences, applied mathematics, bioengineering, and computer sciences. He's He's he, he co-administering over 10 million pounds in research grants, supervising two postdoctoral researchers and five PhD students. In 2019, he was recognized as one of the selected international academics at the University of Nottingham with outstanding contribution. And he is a recipient of the University of Nottingham Vice Chancellor's Medal 2021. So amazing talking about your achievements, Bagus, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, uh, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here amongst you. I am by, not, uh, by no means really uh, an expert in science diplomacy at all. The whole thing came out naturally. And I think it's worth mentioning to you that the idea about large scale engagement with Indonesian universities and government came about in 2020. It was March and I had a conversation with Maria at the time and I uh, threw at her this idea about building a consortium, which she then perfected. And then long story short, in a couple of weeks time, that initiative took place and it, and it uh, draws interest from embassies from both countries 
um, ministers from both countries, academicians, vice chancellors from both countries, and it made UK ICIS, we pronounce it UK CIS, became uh, UK CIS as we know today. So everything that I've done is really owing to um, the great friendship I had with Maria and her uh, always brilliant ideas that makes uh, such an initiative take place. So thank you very much, Maria, for introducing me to colleagues here. Uh, so I'm a junior academic at the University of Nottingham. I only began my tenure as an assistant professor back in 2017. So uh, four years already into my uh, tenure. Um, so ideally, this isn't something that junior academics do. Uh, as you probably know, both, most of the time we are taught to just um, write papers, uh, submit grant publications, and then do normal academic stuff. But there's something that I think um, we can do as Indonesian diaspora, as I was thinking about what our roles might be uh, being a diaspora academic Indonesian abroad. Now, there are, to give you a bit of perspective, there's not so many Indonesian academics working abroad. We're not a country mostly known for producing academics. So we're a country with great culinary, uh, with great dances and culture, exotic languages. We have 700 languages. We're mostly people know about Bali more than Indonesia even. But there are only about 35 or so tenured academics in the UK from Indonesia. Now, I always joke among my peers that there are a lot more Iranian in the University of Nottingham compared to Indonesian in the whole UK. So there's not so many of us. And compared to China, uh, I think our amount is very minuscule. So, um, but it doesn't prevent us from asking that question that I said earlier. What could our roles be uh, to Indonesia? The notion of science diplomacy isn't something that Indonesian normally uh, say. In our conversation with Minister of Foreign Affairs back in 2020, where uh, she, Minister Retno Marsudi, came and saw uh, Dominic Raab in the UK, uh, we mentioned about this term, science diplomacy, and she was very surprised, positively surprised, because it wasn't something that Indonesians are mainly using as their tool for diplomacy. When we made a high engagement events between the UK and Indonesia, and we invited Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the UK side, Professor Carol Mundell attended. She was the chief scientific advisor for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, FCDO in the UK. Now, to give you a little perspective, we don't have that scientific wing in our diplomatic ministry, a foreign affairs ministry. So the whole thing is quite new. Now, um, let me give you an exp um, presentation um, to give you an idea about the whole thing. So, okay, now I hope you can see it clearly. So I am from Institute Technology Bandung, uh, where I did my undergrad study. Uh, ITB with other four universities, ITB Bandung, Universitas Gajah Mada, Institut Pertanian Bogor, and Universitas Indonesia are four Indonesian biggest and most prestigious universities. Let me give you a perspective before we start. There are 4,600 and more universities in Indonesia, 4,600. Um, UK only have about 130, if I'm not mistaken. China, with five times uh, the population of Indonesia, has only about 2,000. Now, Indonesia has so many universities. Now, these are four of the biggest ones. And then among other diaspora, like I said, 35 strong of them in the UK, we started thinking about what we can do to join forces. And then, so this is the background of the UK ICIS or UK CIS as I pronounce it. And then though, since 2019, 2020, I actively wrote in um, Indonesian newspaper about the notion of science diplomacy. And this is the picture where our uh, foreign minister met with Dominic Raab uh, in the midst of pandemic, right? They were wearing masks. Now we understand that even if you have money as a country, you are not guaranteed to get a vaccine. You are at the mercy of countries that can produce vaccines. And then, so that's the state of Indonesia, right? Well, luckily we have a savvy minister of foreign affairs. So we were managed to um, secure vaccines from China, from the UK um, and others. But 
uh, think about other developing countries who doesn't have that power, buying power. So life would be quite difficult for them. Now, Indonesia, uh, to give you another perspective, according to a study by Brand Finance, it's a UK private company that does uh, brand valuation of even countries, rate Indonesian soft power as number 45, as rank 45 out of 50 countries of study. So it's pretty low. Now, one of the criteria by which the soft power is uh, assessed is science and education, where Indonesia rank among the lowest. So, like I said, we are not the country where you would immediately think about the new science emerging from. So that's that's normal. Now, there are, there are connections between these two. When you want to talk about issues like pandemic, like climate change, science is the currency there because it is very it is very non-controversial that you could even use the issue of science to talk about countries you don't normally talk to this is something that i drew inspiration from israel diaspora and germany where through the scientific collaboration championed by the uh, israelis diaspora uh, german and germany and israel can manage to strengthen their bilateral relationship post world war so it is also something that I drew is inspiration from China. Chinese diaspora since the 1970s have been scattered throughout the world, millions of them. And in 1970s, only 300,000 or so come back to become scientific uh, figures in, in China. So at the time they had a problem about brain drain. They've been massively investing on Chinese people studying abroad, but only less than 10% come back. Now, but now they see this as a long-term investment. The uh, scientific stature and influence of this diaspora abroad in biggest UK and US and European institution start to grow and they start to become a scientific superpower uh, behind the US and Europe with one of the largest connections and co-authorship throughout the world by the study of nature. So this is something that the Indonesian government can do, we thought, although at the very minuscule scale. And then so just to give you an idea before Yukichis happened, so there's only about one or two Indonesian tenured academic in Nottingham. I think there's only two at the moment. Uh, so it's a very small number. There's not there is not Indonesian diaspora in UK's biggest university like Oxford, Cambridge, and Imperial, as of, as far as I understand, because we 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 do um, um, study about it. We collect data about Indonesian diaspora throughout the UK. So in Nottingham alone, we try to do the best we can to influence our uh, leadership to do something with Indonesia. We arrange a memorandum of understanding signing between Nottingham and Indonesian universities. We arrange visits from influential figures from Indonesia. We arrange travels from Indonesian, uh, sorry, Nottingham academics to go to Indonesia and give lectures and teach and train Indonesia and build capacity there. We initiated Indonesian language class. Um, had it been because of the pandemic, we would, we would have had the first credit bearing Indonesian language in the Midlands, uh, which is quite a feat for a, for a university that doesn't do cultural study as its main uh, focus, unlike SOAS or SOAS, SOAS as Indonesian language. But, but pandemic uh, took place and then we have to uh, postpone the, this credit bearing module. And then, so this is something that we've done. And individually as diaspora, I also regularly go to Indonesia to give advice to the government. Uh, to the Chief of Presidential Office, uh, to the Ministry of Science, Technology and Higher Education uh, and others. And the thing that I did was to bring other colleagues with me because I'm very limited in terms of expertise. Bear in mind, I'm just a junior academic. But other colleagues have very diverse set of expertise in midwifery, in electric vehicles, in future food and others. So we, and in medicine. So we try to link these colleagues with uh, Indonesia and try to build capacity together. Now, I noticed that there are other academics uh, in the UK, in Warwick University, 
in Coventry University, in Durham, in Newcastle, and others, started to do the same thing that I did. And then so because of our friendship, united by the same language and background of cultures and etc., we thought about joining forces. And this is something that Indonesians don't normally do. Uh, the Indonesian diaspora has been in the UK for many decades, but there isn't something at this scale yet. So we thought, should we make a consortium? I mean, the idea behind that is that we want, we want to make a free movement zone for knowledge so that students and staff can freely access international learning and research environment as if there were no borders. So we thought about having Warwick, Coventry, and Nottingham first, collaborating with ITB, IPB, UGM, and Universitas Indonesia. And we make a consortium uh, trying to tackle issues uh, that has something to do with resilience, which is interdisciplinary in its nature. The idea is to have Indonesian interests at heart and prepare Indonesia for the next pandemic, for the adverse effects of climate change, from natural disasters, Indonesia being in the ring of fire is very prone to volcanic activities, earthquakes, tsunami, as you know it. So these are interdisciplinary uh, research uh, consortium, and we name it UKICIS. And then so uh, we were quite surprised by the response that we get from governments from both sides. So let me give you um, two minutes video. Well, I'm going to fast forward it. Your Excellency. Minister Bad First of all, can you hear what Amanda Soloway were saying? Yes, I can hear it. Okay, so it's just two minutes long. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here to welcome you to the launch of the UK Indonesian Consortium. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate for the establishment of UK Indonesia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Sciences. I think it is uh, a good progress uh, toward closer cooperation between Indonesia and UK in the field of science, technology, and innovation. Of course, we already have a long history of cooperation, and we believe with this kind of consortium, the relationship, especially between universities or research institutions in both countries will be even closer, and the so-called international research collaboration can be implemented very well in each of our respective country. So let me today come to this point. Well, I'm just going to stop it here because the rest is vice chancellors and ambassador saying their remarks. Now, um, so this were in the summer 2020. So it was just a little over one year ago. So in August, in the end of August, as I, as I understood it. And then now since then, Universitas Indonesia joined and then we have had many other engagement where we try to tackle global issues together. So it is now entering the realm of bilateral relationship. It's, and it's no longer university to university research collaborations. So we would invite Nigel Adams and his counterpart from Indonesia, uh, both ambassadors, and then showcase the university's portfolio in pandemic uh, mitigation, for example, vaccines or medicine or other issues that is quite peripheral to uh, vaccination, but quite related to the uh, management of pandemic. Um, and then so through this, the bilateral relationship is strengthened. The um, embassies from both countries use this as best examples of what scientific collaboration can take place. Long story short, this also gets into the KPI of embassies. And no wonder they all jump into the opportunities to support UKICIS. So we can find a way where academics and diplomats work together, not because of charitable um, um, in, um, um, nature of collaboration, but it's truly mutualistic. I think, I think scientific uh, communities um, have yet to realize the potential to amalgamate their scientific endeavors with diplomatic relations. And in this case, in the case of Indonesia and the UK, this starts to bring dividends. At least we gain the attention from government from both countries. Now, um, the more UK ICIS bridge research, the more the government wants to weigh into this. So 
if everything goes well, the UK SEIS will start to administer Indonesian dedicated funding to it. So I cannot talk much at the moment because it has not been ratified yet, but we will have our own funding from the Indonesian government, which we hope to then bring to the UK counterpart and ask for matching funding and start to be able to um, fund our own research. And this is something that it's truly remarkable. There is no consortium like this between Indonesia and Europe, for example. There is nothing like this between Indonesia and Japan, with the US, with Australia, only with the UK. And then we seek to think about emulating this in other countries as well. And then so that's our um, collaboration in terms of global health. And then if you are interested, you can go to our website, ukchis.org.uk. But then what about other subjects? So we also tackle issues that has something to do with Indonesia's greatest strength as a country that produced the most base minerals for battery. Um, if you know, nickel is produced mainly in Indonesia um, and other base minerals for batteries. So naturally, as a country of a, an archipelagic nature, it consisted of 17,000 islands. Indonesia has massive problems with mobility. And this uh, issue about mobility has very deep connection with pandemic management and other disaster management. You could imagine if people in the islands cannot access uh, medis Medicare uh, in Java Island. So you could understand how difficult it is to electrify the whole country. You could understand the massive amount of um, transportation needed to bridge the 17,000 island. Indonesia has the largest domestic flight market in the world. Um, so all of this calls for electric revolution. Short haul flights, for example, is very suitable for electric aircrafts. So the country would like to develop its electric vehicle infrastructures, but does not have the expertise it does not have the base manufacturing to translate high TRL research into commercialized products. And it doesn't even have the regulatory framework, first of all, in order to make road a, a, a simple of a thing like road worthiness tests that is mainly done by the Ministry of Transportation, for example. We don't have the regulatory framework to assess electric vehicles, much less electric vehicles made domestically. So there is some massive problem there that UK ICIS would try to solve. And we solve it because our nature as an interdisciplinary science consortium. Now, so we initiated collaboration with Ministry of Science. We tried to lobby for GCRF funding to be given to Indonesia. And we tried to uh, link our researchers with uh, provincial government. And this is the picture of uh, Governor Ritwan Kamil. Uh, governor, the governor of West Java, which is the most populated province in Indonesia with population of nearly 50 million lives. The UK only has 66 million. So that's just a comparison about how many people there are in Indonesia. Now, this is something that uh, UK Asia has, has just begun to realize in terms of its potential. But in the future, we used to, we want to use this opportunity to strengthen diplomacy the way i see it there's two kinds uh uh i mean two two way of understanding science diplomacy first science for diplomacy and then diplomacy for science so one thing is to use scientific issues as means to strengthen bilateral relationship another thing is the other way around to use bilateral relationship to strengthen science and to actually solve problems and drive innovations this is the two things that Yukichis try to um, play back and forth from one to another. And then so that's just a little bit about what we can do. Now, the aspiration moving forward is to make Indonesia, through scientific collaboration, rises in its uh, recognition, uh, soft powers and others. Indonesia is the place where nearly 50% of geothermal powers in the world uh, exist. So, when you talk about renewable energy, it's impossible to exclude Indonesia from the discussion. But unlocking the geothermal potential is another matter because it's a very, very difficult issue. Unlike taking oil out of the subsurface, 
uh, geothermal sites has very different manifestations. Some are in the form of volcano, some are shallow, uh, depth buried, buried underground, uh, some are high enthalpic, some are low enthalpic. Uh, when it comes to electric revolutions, we have the battery and we have the uh, potential to unlock the uh, electric revolution. But also in social sciences, we are a country, like I said, of 700 languages. I always joke in Indonesia, if you drive three hours, you'll meet people uh, speaking different language. And I'm not talking about like in the UK driving to Scotland and you find people speaking with funny accent. That's not it. But I'm talking about real different languages. So it is very curious when you think about how come a country with 700 languages languages maintains its political stability fairly well, fairly well. I mean, I know that the East Timor broke away from Indonesia, but fairly well considering the amount of languages there are. I noticed that Belgium for once had problems in uh, mid early 2000, 2010s, for example, not having government for some quite period of times because you know, the constituency of some four different languages couldn't uh, agree on the government. But how come Indonesia can do that? So this is something that can be cultivated by science. What about Indonesia as one of, um, along with Brazil, I believe, as the largest biodiversities in the world, right? Coffee and other uh, species. What about tropical diseases? This is something that we share, right? Um, so the new medicine and the new food uh, has to come from countries like this, and it has to be unlocked by scientific collaborations. And along with it, new products will drive jobs and strengthen the collaboration together. So more than ever in this, in this era where anything that, anything that takes place tends to have global consequences, science diplomacy is very critical. Take pandemic, for example, it's just not isolated, isn't it? Because of the international, the nature of international travels, one country can affect another country in a split second. Well, not just quite second, but you get the point. You know, so science diplomacy, as I think about it, is somewhat like a natural antidote to that. You know, so we have to champion it. And I'm so uh, privileged to be with you, amongst you today. And I hope we could scale up this discussion so as to include uh, key stakeholders in the future, the people that matters and actually can make a decision or have decision-making power. So I would stop at that. I believe I've spoken for about 30 minutes at the moment. So very looking forward to some discussions with you.